Good morning, Mount Movers Church family and friends and newcomers. Glad to see you this morning. Hey, if you're new to Mount Movers, we want to welcome you and say we're glad you're here this morning. And you picked a good day to be here, I think. Great, great weather outside, yeah. and we're ready to go. Hey, I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing with you what God has laid on my heart this morning. How many of you this morning would say that you like roller coasters? A bunch of kids, right? Hey, for Bishop family, we are roller coaster junkies. Back last summer, we went to St. Louis and spent a couple of days up there, and we went to Six Flags one day. And if you didn't know, Six Flags claims to be the roller coaster capital of Missouri. Now, being the roller coaster enthusiasts that we are, we decided that it was our responsibility to decide whether or not they really were the roller coaster capital of Missouri. So they have about seven roller coasters in all, and the kids and I rode every single one of them at least one time and a couple of them twice. Now Shelby, she likes to ride with us, but she normally gets a little woozy after a couple of times and uh, she has to sit out. I believe it's because she screams from the time she gets on to the time she gets off. She will argue against that, but I know that that's what it is. So anyway, they have they have three wind roller coasters and they will absolutely beat, beat you to a pulp. They have one called uh, the Ninja, and when you get down with it, you'll feel like you've been beat up by a ninja. They have one called Batman that turns over about 15 times. I'm not kidding, 15 times really. Uh, they have one called the Boomerang that lasts about 6.2 seconds. It actually takes longer to get on and buckle up than it does for the ride to run. They have one called Mr. Freeze. Now, Mr. Freeze is a pretty cool ride, and and if you if you're probably getting car sick, I wouldn't recommend that you ride it. Because you go through it the first time backwards, and you come back through it forward. But it's a pretty cool ride. And to get to Mr. Freeze, you have to walk down this long, dark hallway. Now, it was air conditioned, so in the middle of July, that was pretty good. But when you get to the end of this hallway, it opens up into a big room, and they have a loading station on both sides. So once you get in the cart that you're going to ride, you have to sit there and wait for the car on the other side to go and come back. Because it's just a one-way track, okay? So when it comes your time to go, they do a countdown. It's a three, two, one type thing. Well, we didn't make it to zero on ours. It's three, two, you're gone. Well, you know, I was almost 40 at that time. They can give somebody a heart attack like that. You know, give me a little bit of a warning, okay? So anyway, you go through this thing forward, you come back. Well, when they shoot you out of there, they shoot you out of this dark tunnel about 60 mile an hour. So when you hit the end of that tunnel, you're hit in the face by this by the sun. You know, because in the middle of the day, the sun in July is hot, and the sun is just beating down hot on you, right? So you blow out of this dark tunnel, and that sun just blinds you. Well, that got me to thinking, on oh, that ride, about the, the sun, that bright light that hit me in the face. And it reminded me of the fact that, you know, as, as followers of Jesus Christ and disciples of Jesus, we are called to be the salt and the light of the earth. You know, it, it was a pretty neat ride, but that was, that was a good experience because it really, it really hit me in the face about this. Okay? So let's go to the Lord in prayer because Jesus has actually given us some instructions about being the salt and the light of the earth. Father God, we thank you for this day, Lord. I just ask, Lord, that God, that you would bless this message, Father, and that you would bless each and every family that is represented here today, Lord God. Father, I just thank you for this opportunity, Father, and I just praise you, Lord, and I give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you have your word with you this morning, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. And if you don't have it, we'll have it on the screen. Matthew 5, 13 through 16 says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that you may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Anybody here like fried potatoes? Yeah. Have you ever tried fried potatoes that don't have any season on them? They're normally pretty bland and they really don't taste very good without salt, right? But if you have a little sea salt or seasoned salt to those potatoes, they become a delicacy, right? Well, at least in the South. <laughs> so Jesus told the disciples that they were to be the salt of the whole earth. And he told them to go out into the, into the whole world and share the gospel. Now, I can't, I can't help but think, you know, if I were one of those disciples at that point, I probably may have been a little bit discouraged or maybe a little bit intimidated, you know, 
because they felt like they were weak and a little bit small in comparison. But that's just what they thought. You know, he told them to go out there and share the gospel in the entire world. And you know what? That's what they did. They went out to be the salt and the light of the entire world. And they changed the entire world. But you know what? If, if they had done that with the attitude of the fact that they were being forced to do it, they probably wouldn't have done very good. Matter of fact, they may have balked at it and just not done it at all. But they went out and they worked willingly and they were affected like salt. If you take a handful of salt and you throw it out there on the entire earth, it's going to season the entire earth and change the world. And that's exactly what they did. And you know what? We as disciples and followers of Jesus, that's what we're called to do is be the salt and the light of the earth. Yeah. When Jesus talked about salt that, that has become tasteless or lost its flavor, you can kind of look at it as though he's talking about someone who's lost their flair their or their, their fire for Christ. Not necessarily meaning that, that they don't want to believe, but that they, they've lost a little bit of their passion and their enthusiasm that they had when they first believed. You know, when we, we first become believers, we're all pumped up and amped up. We want everybody to know. We want to shout it out. We want to let everybody know about our newfound faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know, sometimes things change. You know, when, when, we're, when we first believe, we want Jesus to fill our hearts and be proud of us. And we want to go out there and we want to season that skill and fried potatoes a little bit. And you know, the truth of the matter is that Jesus wants us to carry that, that flare or that fire for eternity. Right. Yeah. But it's not always easy. Yeah. You know, it, when we first believe, man, we may be in church every time the doors are open. We may be here on, on Sunday nights, Sunday mornings, Wednesday evenings. But you know, sometimes life happens. You know, we may run into a rough spot and we get burnt out. You know, we, we sometimes become a little bland or a little complacent. And we may start to lose our hope. We may start to make excuses as to why we don't show up on Wednesday night. Well, I got off work late. I have to get up early tomorrow. Man, it's, it's already Wednesday. I just lost track of the days. And, you know, a lot of times we're, we're just tired. You know, life happens. We, but we use those for excuses. You know, the next thing we know, we find ourselves getting up late on Sunday morning, missing every other week, sometimes hitting one Sunday a week or one Sunday a month. And then the next thing you know, we just stop showing up all together. Then we have the other side of that coin where a new believer is all, they're on fire for Christ. And they're amped up and they're serving, they're teaching, maybe driving the van. They're on every committee that they can be on. And then the next thing you know, they've gotten so busy and so worked up in church that they hit a brick wall. And they, they just flatline and become burnt out. You know, they, we get so caught up that we sometimes get overwhelmed and our attitude begins to lose fire and we begin to be, become overwhelmed. And we forget what we're supposed to be doing. Serving and worshiping the one true God. And you know, I mentioned new believers here, but this is not just for new believers. This is for everybody. Right. Every single one of us in this room right. are in jeopardy of hitting this spot. Right. So it's, it's part of our job as believers, new believers, to keep feeding that fire. Yes. And, and don't, don't quit. Yeah. So what does it mean for us to be the salt of the earth? You see, you and I as disciples, we are called the salt of the earth because our lives enhance or give meaning to our existence called life. You see, before salvation, we're all just like a bunch of little little uh, grains of sand. And, and we're not really that much different. We're all pretty much the same. Some of us are a little bigger, some of us are a little fatter. But we're all pretty much the same. That's not funny, is it? But you know, after we receive Christ, we're transformed. Right. So, it's a transformation that takes place. And we're, and we're transformed from this minuscule little piece of sand that's not much different than anybody else into a into a let's see it's it's a distinct it's something that has a distinctive taste yeah. or a distinctive aroma and a distinctive texture. It's much different than what we were before. Right. You know, it may be odd that, that Jesus used this analogy of sand, but he compares believers to salt for a purpose, and that's because salt is a a dietary mineral that is used for flavoring and preservation. Right. And it's also needed by 
pretty much every living creature on the planet, except for slugs. <laughs> slugs don't like salt. Man. Have you ever seen what, what slugs do when you pour, pour salt on them? Go and try that, kids. <laughs> so what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? <coughs> Jesus says, in other words, if a Christian has lost their flavor, or if they've lost their gusto or their fervor for Christ, they're really not much different than what they were before. Right. They're not much different from that old grain of sand in this new so-called salt. You see, as disciples, we're not only to be the salt of the earth, but we're also, so, also supposed to be the light of the world. Yeah. I remember one morning last winter, I was driving to work down toward Rogers, and when I and, and that weekend we had a little bit of snow with a little bit of freezing rain on top of it, so the, the ground was kind of icy and really really reflective. And I got to Bella Vista there, and I came to the Casey store. And you guys know what the Casey signs look like? They're yellow and have the red and green on them for the gas prices. But I remember I was being mesmerized by the way those lights were shining off of that snow and ice. It made me think, you know, as followers of Christ, that's the type of light that folks should see shining off of us. They should see the light of Christ emanating from us and bouncing off of us like it was bouncing off that snow and ice that morning. You know, I kind of envisioned much like that when I was riding Mr. Freeze and the way that that light hit me in the face. You know, we, we want it to be so bright and so shiny that it blinds people and it may take them a few minutes to figure out where that glow is coming from. That's right. That's right. You know, light is an important theme in Scripture and it normally emphasizes the removal of dark and, and the unfolding of biblical history and theology. <coughs> and the literal contrast between physical light and darkness gives us an insightful, symbolic uh, contrast between unearthly good and evil or God and evil forces or believers and, and non-believers. And Jesus declared that he was the light of the world, who had come as a light that enlightens all people, so that anyone who believes in him would no longer be in darkness. In John 8 12, it says that Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I'm going to be open and honest and transparent with you this morning. I'm a grown man, I can handle it. I used to be scared of the dark. <laughs> Now you laugh because you think I'm talking like when I was 12, but I'm not. I mean, I'm, I'm talking like into my, into my mid-20s, I was scared of the dark. It's not funny, Gavin. You know, I have feelings. This fear of the dark, of course, was an irrational fear that was manifested by my own doing. Brad Misty preached on this a while back, and I had never made the connection between the two until that time. See, I used to be a scary movie junkie. And I would watch them all. You guys ever heard of the Saw series? Yes. Yeah. Stop watching. <laughs> you see, I, I was a junkie. I love those movies. The Saw series, The Darkness Falls, all of them. I was hooked on them. But you know, those, the things that were being portrayed in those movies began to stick in my mind. And I had never made that connection before. So it wasn't necessarily the darkness of night that I was scared of. It was the things that my mind had been convinced that you know, the things that were lurking out there in that darkness. That's a, those were the things I was scared of. So what it all boils down to is the fact that I wasn't walking with Jesus and I wasn't traveling His light. I was doing my own thing. You see, when we're, when we're walking in the light of Jesus, the darkness is not something we have to fear. That's right. That's good. Matthew 4.16 says, The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death, upon them light dawned. It was my habits and the lack of my right positioning with God that created my fear. That's good. And the scripture says, talks about those who were sitting in the darkness that was me. I was one of those sitting in the darkness. Jesus says in John 9, 5, He says, While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I look back and I say, you know, thankfully for me, that God shined His light on me. Because now I can say that I'm walking in the light of Christ. And that fear that I had in the dark is no longer there. 
And if you want to know more about that, you come see me after service, and we'll talk about that. Because there's a story there, and I would love to, I would love to share with you. Matthew 5, 14 says, You are the light of the world, the city set on a hill cannot be hidden. The light of revelation from God that accompanies Jesus' announcement of the kingdom, it's not just carried by the disciples. You see, each and every one of us in this room today, we are to be that light of the, light of the world, a city set up on a hill. The city to which Jesus refers to here could be, could be the city of Jerusalem, which sits up on Mount Zion. And, and this could be due to the fact that Israel, with Jerusalem as the holy city, was considered to be the light of the world. In, in Isaiah, we read out in Isaiah 49 to 6, he says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Now it's believed that at this particular time in chapter 5 that Jesus is actually in Galilee near Capernaum. And he could be used in any city you know, that was in that area uh, as his illustration. Because a lot of times that's what he did. If you read, you find out that Jesus will use um, his surroundings as part of his teaching. But in either case, it doesn't really matter. Because what he's telling us here is a city on a hill, you can't hide that. Have you ever driven down Interstate 70 out of that dark place of Kansas into Colorado toward Denver? Man, you can't hide that. This is on a mountaintop. So that's what Jesus is saying here. When you're on the mountaintop, it's hard, it's hard to be hidden. Be up there. Be up on that mountain. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, and neither should that light that's inside of us. Matthew 5.15 says, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. You know, if you went around your house today, you had three or four light bulbs that would burn out. Would you go replace those light bulbs with no intention of ever turning them on? <laughs> Probably not. Would you go turn on your reading lamp in the corner and throw a blanket over to try to kill the light on it? Probably not. You would not. <laughs> So why do we want to hide that light that's inside of us? The light of Christ that fills us when we become believers of Jesus Christ, when we truly believe that He is the light of this world and our Savior. It just doesn't make sense. You know, the lamps that they used in a typical Palestinian home, they were like a little, they were a little clay, clay bowl reservoir, and they had a hole in the top to pour oil in them. And they had a spout on one end for a, a piece of uh, flax or cotton when you sit it in there. That's what they lit. Well, I don't have one of those today, so we're going to have to use these candles, okay? Now, the typical Jewish home was a modern... It wasn't modern. You know, that they didn't have internet or cable or anything like that. <laughs> it, was a, it was a modest one-room structure, okay? And, and what they would do is they would take a, a lamp or they would put it up on a lamp stand so they would illuminate the whole room, okay? So I've got a little illustration I want to do here. You guys bear with me because this is obviously, this is not a really good light, okay? Just bear with me. I'm going to go down on the floor, okay? We're going to sit this here, kill them. So if we take this candle and we sit it here, this candle's not going to do us much good. Now, now Gavin over here, he might be able to tie his shoes with the light off of this. But I'm pretty sure if Travis tries to tie his shoes in the back row, he's going to wind up tying Erica's shoes because he can't see his own shoes, right? <laughs> but if we take this candle, we go back up on the platform, and bear with me, you'll hear me here. This is not a real good light. But if we were to sit it up here, I can see more of your faces now. It's good. It's good. Now if we take this candle, We covered up. I know the dark, they're not completely dark. Just because of humor. It's going to kill the light. And that's that's the only time they put a, put a basket or a bowl over their candle was at night when they're going to bed to kill the light. Okay? But if we do that, this I want to illustrate this to you that the room is dark right now and there's, there's an absence of light. And if we don't let the light of Christ shine from us it's like it's supposed to, this world will be an extremely dark place. Yeah, 
You know, as the disciples of Christ, we are called to be the light of the world. Yeah. And, and we cannot allow our light to be hidden. Because our very nature, the kingdom life that is inside of us, <coughs> is a testimony to those who do not have that light yet. Right. Yeah. How, can others, how can others who don't know Christ come to know Jesus or know what we're all about if we continually put a basket or a bowl over that lamp that we have or that flame that we have burned bright? You, know, you, you realize that, that the average American person has a sphere of influence of 250 people, some less, some more. Mm -hmm. Now some of you are probably thinking, I don't know 250 people. And that may be true, you personally may not know 250 people. But the impact that you have on the people you do know right. will flow through them into the people that they know and so on. Amen. So God has intended for us to impact a lot of people. Yes. But we can't do that if we're A, not salting that skill of fried potatoes, mm -hmm. or B, we're not letting that light shine for the world to see. Yes. In Matthew 5 and 6 it says, Let your light shine in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You see, our good works are produced by the life and, and the life inside of us, which comes from only the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's not of our own doing. There's nothing we can do to help that. But we have, to, we have to let others see us in action. And when they do see us in action, we want them to look past us and glorify our Father in heaven. You see, actually our desire should be for them to not even see us at all, right? right. We want that light beaming out of us to be so bright yes, amen. that they don't even see us at all. That they see the light of Christ emanating from us. That they see the light of Christ emanating from every square inch of our body. Yes, We're called to be the light of the world. Are we doing so? Yes. And when I say we, I mean me as well. <laughs> Are we shining bright for those around us to see the light of Christ shining from us? The light that we're talking about here, it's the light that will light our path and, and give us hope when all seems lost. Yeah. It's the light that should and will shine bright for others to see. Yeah. It's the light that should make others say, hey, what's different about you? Yeah, that's right. yeah. It's the light that should make others say, I don't know what she has or what he has, but I sure would like some of that. It's a, it's a light that should make others ask us why we're so happy all the time. Sorry. It's a light that will teach us the difference between right and wrong. Okay. It's a light that exposes the dark and chases out our fears. Okay. It's a light that others should see being out of us like the sun on a hot summer day. It's a light that fills our lives when we give our lives to Christ. Are you shining bright so others who may not know the Lord Jesus Christ may, may become inquisitive and ask you what it is that brings you so much joy that they begin to ask you questions? Yeah, that's right. Because that's what we want. That's right. We want others to question what it is about us that makes us different. Yeah. Maybe we're living our lives like, like the rest of the world. Or we live in our lives like the salt and the light that we're called to be. Because this dark and hurt world needs us. Maybe we're just living the status quo. Maybe we're just churching it up on Sundays and sometimes Wednesday, but living like the rest of the world the rest of the week. You know, salt will be of absolutely no good to us if it has no flavor. And a, and a candle or a lamp is no good to us if, we, if we're always placing a basket over it and covering it up. I want to leave you with a couple of questions today. The first one is, are you flavoring to the world or have you become bland and complacent? And number two is, are you lighting the path for others that will lead them to, to Christ? Or have you placed a, a bowl or a basket over that candle and killed that flame that's inside of you? We were made to shine. Are you ready to shine bright so that others who may not know Jesus Christ will want to know what it is about you that makes you shine so bright? Are you ready to shine so that others can see that you have a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious? 
There's no better time than right now to shine because this world is a darkest place and it needs us every single day. This world needs the light of Christ now more than ever. Are you ready to shine? Let's shine bright for the world to see. Would you stand this morning? If this message spoke to you this morning, and I truly hope it did, maybe you're here this morning and you're saying, you know what, my, my life is taking a hit. Maybe I'm a little blame and replace it. Maybe I just need an awakening. With every head bowed this morning, every eye closed. If you if you be honest this morning, say that's me, I want to pray with you this morning. Father God, we stand before you this morning. Many of us need a spiritual awakening, Father God, a spiritual makeover. And Father God, I thank you, Father God, and I pray that you empower each and every one of us this morning, Father God, to be the salt and the light of this broken world that this really needs, Lord. Father, I ask that you would instill in us, Lord God, the wisdom and the knowledge and the boldness, Father, for us to shine bright for the world to see. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you would help us become the spiritual warrior or the Christ-like disciple that you intended each and every one of us to be, Lord God. Father, I thank you for that. I want to give an opportunity for those who may not have experienced that real and life-changing relationship with Jesus that we talk about here at Mount Lewis Church every Sunday, every Wednesday, and every time we're here. If that's you this morning, and you've never had that experience that you want to, we want to pray with you this morning. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, let me see your hands if that's you. Real life change on three. One, two, three. Let's see your hands. Thank you. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your son Jesus. Father God, we thank you for your son Jesus. Father, I know that I've sinned and fallen short. Father, I know that I've sinned and fallen short. Father, cleanse my heart and make me clean. Father, cleanse my heart and make me clean. I believe with all my heart that Jesus is who He says He is. I believe with all my heart that Jesus is who He says He is. I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I dedicate my life to you, God. According to your word, and never to be the same again. In Jesus' name we pray. Hey, thanks so much for joining us today. If you want to be a part of something bigger than yourself, give to our ministry. We've made giving easy here at Mountain Movers Church. If you have your smartphone, just text the number 918-223-8090. Just push in the amount you want to give and push send. It's that easy. If you don't have your smartphone, not a problem. You can mail your giving just as easy to 24,000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma, 74344. Thanks for watching today. Hey, remember, we're dreaming big for you. We'll see you next week.